Hi everyone, good evening. Um, many thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm just going to wait a couple of minutes to let some people come who've come on a little bit. They will give them a couple of minutes leeway and then we'll start. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, this really important parent event. I thought I think we can all agree that we'd rather not be here tonight discussing the types of things that we are going to discuss. But equally, that now uh, that, that the uh, terrible uh, happenings are going on in Israel, that as parents, that we are equipped with knowing how to deal with. Um, the issues with our children, with our teens, and with ourselves. And I have with me um, some great panelists and fellow therapists. Um, I have Hannah Hughes. Hannah, you might have heard on one of our other parent events. It works with the NHS <clears throat> and with families. And as well as that, um, based in Israel, I'm delighted to say um, that Deborah has joined us last minute and um, will be providing us with a wealth of experience that she's got, um, not only um, being the fact that she's on the ground in Israel, but also the experience that she's got working with teenagers or working with adults um, using cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I am Yaakov Barr. I'm the clinical director of JTEEN. And um, as I say, welcome to all of you tonight. Um, what tonight isn't going to be is it's not going to be a long lecture. I think all of us, um, the reason why we're on here tonight is because we're all feeling um, rather tense, anxious, and we're certainly not in the mood to listen to um, long drawn out speeches. Um, so what we're going to have is really, we're going to discuss some of the key issues from our experts. We have had some uh, a huge range of questions that have come in. We're going to try and deal with the really important ones. And as well as that, we can see from the text line and the phone line, the teens that are messaging already last night, today, tonight, um, we, we can really, really feel um, what they're struggling with. And so we're going to incorporate some of that, those worries and those fears tonight. OK, um, I would like to start off with... Um, Hannah, if you don't mind, I think the big question is, um, you know, as we've all, so some of us have got children of different ages, they'll all be talking about it. How do we talk to, let's, if we start off to first with the younger children, how do we talk to younger children, Hannah, about um, the horrors that we're seeing going on in Israel? Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Yaakov. And, uh, Again, our, all our thoughts and prayers are with Israel, and um, it's been such a horrific few days. And I know that I and all of us really have been through this roller coaster of emotions during this time. And I think a certain level of anxiety, worry, uh, pain, loss is really, really normal for us to experience during such horrific brutality and, and witnessing those sort of experiences that our brothers and sisters are experiencing in Israel. Um, so really strong emotions are going to be really normal during this time, both for us and for our children. Um, and when you said, Yaakov, how to talk to our children, I wondered whether maybe a, a different type of question is how to listen to our children, because I think the listening to our children is really as important as the talking to our children. Um, 
It's not just that we're going to sit them down and give them a lecture and tell them all the details, but we're really going to listen to where they're at. Do they know about it? Do they know all the details? Do they want to know all the details? Are they worried or are they just not worried? Um, each child can respond so differently. Uh, that's not just dependent on the child's personality, his experiences, his understanding, his age. I'm going to speak a little later about age appropriate explanations, but also um, whether they have relatives in Israel, whether they, whether they actually are connected to people that they are worried about. I know some children have siblings who are being called up during this time. So understandably, they're going to be much more worried the reality of the horrors of, of potential really difficult and, and, and tough things happening are going to be really close to home for them. Uh, so naturally, they're going to need a lot more support and the family in general are going to need a lot more support. Uh, the feelings are going to be much more heightened for those sorts of families. So uh, I think the situation really does differ from family to family. And you as parents uh, are the experts over your family and over your children. So what I say now are going to be some tips, some ideas. Um, and really for you as the experts to incorporate into using whether you use them or whether you don't with your own children. Uh, so how to talk to children. I, I think in general, we as parents, we have two hats, broadly speaking. We have the hat of being the parent, which is the person who is responsible for their health and the well-being of our children and is retaining that sort of position. Um, and also the hat of our own personal experiences our own experiences, this roller coaster of emotion, our own experiences of, of fear, of worry, um, of, of concern, of pain, of loss. Um, those massive feelings we're going to be experiencing as well of shock. Um, so it's really important to wear these two hats and to kind of honor these two roles that we have. Our own experiences, our own emotional reactions that can be informed by our own backgrounds. We might have you know, previous history of anxiety. We might have close friends and families out in Israel. We might have a relationship, a recent loss that we've experienced that these events might be triggering. Um, so it's really important to notice what's going on for us as independent people, just as, as uh, not as parents to notice it, to be aware of it, and to really think about how we can support ourselves during this time, to rely on our network of friends. I know there's been a lot of talk on WhatsApp groups, people reaching out to each other, um, to increase our self-care, maybe our exercise, uh, to try and carry on our activities basically as normal, um, but also to reach out and increase our resources and our areas of resilience whenever we can, to really think about how to look after ourselves during this time. And then our other hat as a parent. So if we have really tried to attend to looking after our own emotional reactions, we might be able to feel in a little bit of a better place when we do start talking to our children. Um, and that's the idea, broadly speaking. Again, it differs so much from family to family and from families in which, you know, mothers have sons that are being called up currently. Maybe this uh, you know, the, the crisis is going to be ongoing, the panic, the waves of panic and fear are going to be rising and falling almost constantly throughout the day. Um, but in general, if you do have your support network together, if you are reaching out regularly, if you are kind of increasing your self-care, giving yourself breaks, being compassionate to yourself um, and, and appreciating that every emotional reaction is a normal and an OK reaction. It's not that some people are coping and better and some people aren't coping and feel embarrassed or feel like a failure. Any emotional reaction is OK. And if we feel this about ourselves and our spouses as well, then we can transmit this and we can model this for our children. So really being aware and attuned to our own reactions, our own emotions as we go through the day and managing them before we think about putting on our parent hats and thinking about how we're going to support our children. Thinking about our children, uh, the reason why I delineate these two roles, I think, is because we don't want the, to be in the position where we really are relying very heavily on our children for their support. We want to retain the parental support where we're the ones giving the parental position where we're the ones offering the support. We're the ones who are retaining that position of authority where we are in charge of the safety and well-being of our children. And of course, we can't make any guarantees. There are times when it's really uncertain for us, really scary for us, and we can't control the situation. But wherever possible and whenever possible, we are the parent and we are going to look after our children and make sure that they're safe. And when we come from this position, speaking to our children, then naturally I think they feel a little bit more contained. 
And these big, scary, difficult feelings, uncertainty, lack of control, huge worry, fear, pain at what's been happening to our people, these massive feelings, we can hold them, we can contain them. Um, we can have this, this kind of broad feeling of reassurance that our children feel that they're being looked after if we come from that position. So explanation, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna broadly uh, speak of rules of thumb, and then I'm going to go through each uh, kind of age bracket to think about how to speak to our children in an age appropriate way. So first of all, as, as I spoke about, listening to our children is really important, hearing where they're up to and keeping the door open that if they have any questions, if there's anything they heard in the playground, if they have any queries, they can come back to us and we're going to help them find the answers or we're going to find somebody who knows the answers or is more likely to know some answers. As parents, we don't have to be this omnipotent power who sees everything and knows everything. We have our human weaknesses. We're scared as well. We feel uncertain and worried as well. But what we can do is we can commit ourselves to doing everything we can to support our children, to make sure they're safe and to help them find other people who they might want to speak to. This is a really strong message that I, I firmly believe in. Yes, we're parents and we are primarily responsible for the safety and well-being of our children. But we have a huge network that can, we can rely on as well. This is particularly important when we think about our teens. Our adolescents, our adolescents often don't want to hear necessarily reassurance from parents. They often respond better if they um, are being spoken to by an older cousin or a friend, somebody in their network, somebody at school. But in our community, we've seen and actually I've been extremely inspired by the response of the community, both here and, and abroad. Um, we have those support networks. We have the school who are really on it. The schools are sending out emails saying that if you have any concerns, please speak to us and please make use of these resources, make use of the wonderful services in our communities. We have JTEEN, we have schools, we have community rabbis. If you think about the adolescents, adolescent minds often jump from feeling these big feelings of being scared and worried to these philosophical or existential questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why should I be Jewish if I'm gonna be treated like this? Um, are we, you know, the only minority community who experienced this sort of persecution? Uh, why is this happening again? They might have really strong existential questions and we don't have to have all the answers. Really, it's so important to, as parents, we, we have a lot that we ha are responsible for, but we don't have to be responsible for everything. We can rely on our, and reach out to our Rabbonim, to the charities, to our services, to our institutions, to our schools, and we can use their support and use their advice. So if there is a concern, if your child is worried a little bit more um, than you think you can manage, or maybe they're not reaching out to you, then reach out to somebody in your network and give that email to the school and send that email to somebody. And uh, they possibly might feel comfortable and feel reassured to speak to somebody in Israel who can speak to them about how things are going and can reassure them. Again, it's really difficult because feelings of uncertainty and anxiety and fear are really normal. It's an uncertain time. None of us know what's going to happen. But I think we also do know that our people are resilient. Our nation is resilient. We have been through this before. We've been through pain and loss and difficulty and hardship. And as a nation, we've pulled through. And if you're somebody who is strong in their emunah and their faith and if you have that sort of family value that you feel comfortable um, and your children don't feel threatened by sharing uh, that adolescence in particular then you can really pray together and daven together and do so many things that can support the community in Israel during this time. I think broadly speaking the two main themes that make the anxiety and the fear really difficult is uh, being, the feeling of being isolated, the feeling of being alone, and the lack of control. So if we flip that around as parents, even if we aren't speaking explicitly about the crisis and about what's happening um, and any details, even if we have somebody who, a child who maybe doesn't want to speak about the gory details and doesn't want to even speak about the subject, if we increase our connection with them, if we increase our presence, if we increase the feelings of safety and comfort and connection with them around the home during family times, then that in itself does serve to support them during this anxious time. 
And similarly, if we increase their feelings of agency, so there's so many things during this crisis that we can't control, but there are things that we can control, such as our prayer, reaching out to other people, um, reaching out to all the lovely charities who have been uh, raising money and supporting the IDF during this time. There's even one person who is uh, collecting emails from school-aged children to send to the soldiers who are on the front line and printing them out, uh, printing out pictures or printing out drawings. So there's so much that we can do. So if we increase, broadly speaking, our connection to our children during this time and our sense of agency and our children's sense of agency, that can be really helpful. As well as that using emotion words, using increasing our emotional literacy, using feelings and not being afraid to speak about difficult feelings and feel difficult feelings. If we are present with our children, if we give space to our children and listen to our children, then they might say they're worried, they're scared. And that's really difficult sometimes for a parent to hear, especially a little child, and especially when it is half an hour past bedtime, which is usually when these children reach out. Just a thing or two about when children reach out. Um, we're gonna be proactive in terms of speaking to our children because um, then that makes them feel like we're more in control and we we can be proactive and kind of um, um, navigate the conversation a little bit. But we're also going to be responsive and open the door and ready for them to ask questions whenever they need to. And often that really is bedtime. Often that really is the time just when parents decide to close the door and unwind um, and, and try and settle, have some time for themselves. Often that's when the child feels more anxious because they feel that the parents are more distant during that time. So often it is in the middle of the night or it is during bedtime. So it's really important to be more available during this time and to be emotionally present with them. And, and it is really, really difficult. You know, obviously we are people with our own lives and our own responsibilities, our own pressures and our own exhaustion during this time. It's, it's emotionally exhausting for all of us. Um, so it's really difficult to have patience. Um, so again, back to the theme of looking after ourselves first and relying, leaning on our support network. We're not alone. We're very lucky to have the community support that we do. So please lean on the support network and reach out if you're struggling and reach out if your children are struggling as well. And we're going to speak a little bit more about that. And, uh, so let's, gonna, uh, if we just sort of move on just to a, a sort of a question that many people are asking, um, and I want to sort of bring in Deborah here um, for this really important question. Unfortunately, um, with the age of social media, where our children have been exposed to um, the most, and we've all we've all seen the most horrific um, footage of um, the atrocities that have been committed. Um, and we've had a lot of teens messaging in to JT, concerned parents, their children can't fall asleep. Um, they've seen that videos they shouldn't have seen. What advice can you give um, to parents that children, unfortunately, who have already been exposed to um, some of these videos on social media? Deborah, can you uh, unmute, yeah. Sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you, Yakov, for having me on the panel this evening. Um, this is a very contentious issue um, because social media is doing its rounds. A huge amount of it is incited by Hamas to generate fear. And as you can see, it is working. So the challenge that we have is, is our children's exposure to social media. Only earlier today, I received a message from parents of a child who was uh, six years of age that had been exposed to pictures and videos um, on social media. It is fighting an ogre, literally, dealing with social media. The challenge is because it's available at all times during the day and for, especially for teenagers, if they have their phones in their rooms at night. Um, so we have to be very clever how we tackle this monster and how we tackle speaking to our children about exactly the things that Hannah was saying. So. The challenge is, first of all, we have to understand that before we can even say to our children and start helping them be able to fall asleep, we have to address the truth. 
And yes, that needs to be filtered. And yes, that needs to be navigated according to the age. But one of the first rules of thumb is the following, be real about it. However you speak to your children, be real. This doesn't mean that we say, oh, by the way, did you see this picture and that picture on social media this evening? We're not talking about exposing them to vivid pictures, but in the way that we talk has a huge impact on the way that our children begin to build trust and rely on our perspective. We are their ultimate perspectives to the outside world, irrespective of what they see on social media, if they believe that we get it, if they believe that we've heard them and that we understand, they will trust what we say more. The way in which we generate this is by being real. So if a child comes and says, what does this mean? And I saw this terrible thing, it is true. There are some very challenging things being sent around on social media at the moment. Israel is in a very challenging situation. There are lots of things that are very tough, okay? These kind of statements are disarming. These kind of statements help children sit back and say, okay, right? So you get it. Yes, I get it. Now, we can't turn around to somebody and say, don't, don't watch that, okay? Don't do it because you know children don't do what we tell them to do, okay? They do what we do. So what does that mean in this capacity? Because yes, we're spending a huge amount of time on our phones and the discussions that I'm having with you right now about what we do with our children, I've been having it with adults that are on social media throughout the night, cannot sleep, highly distressed, panic attacks. It's the same dynamic. So how do we actually stop it? The way in which we can start is we have to make a choice. As challenging as it is, we have to make a choice. What do we want? And this is a conversation that we have with our children. These videos, these pictures are there. They are in our face. They have been deliberately put there to do exactly what this conversation is about, to scare you and to scare me and to scare every single Jew across the world. You're right. So at this point, we get to choose right now what we do with it. Now, it doesn't mean if we turn around and say, that's it, I'm not looking at anything else, that we don't care, that we don't support, that we, we are not thinking and worrying and fearing for Israel and everybody that's there. That's not what it means. There are ways, as Hannah described previously, that we can engage our children in partaking, in supporting and being part of anything that can provide assistance to the people of Israel, especially to our soldiers and, and the people really on the front line. But we, in our houses, at home, we get to choose what we expose ourselves to. We have to make a decision when something comes through, do I press that button? If I press that button, what am I going to think and what am I going to feel like afterwards? Okay, do I want to feel that way? Isn't it hard enough right now knowing what's going on? Do I want to do that right now? And if the answer is no, then delete, swipe remove. We get to choose and we have to remind our children that that is the case and that we, these are obviously for slightly older and I'm, I'm talking eight year olds you can have this conversation with because we have our developmental shift that takes place at the age of seven to eight where we become much more critically aware, we start to ask questions this is a really good time to have that conversation. Is this the right thing? If your friends at school are showing you or your friends outside of school on the bus, hey, look at this. Did you see this picture? No, I do not want to see it. Remember, a reminder again, it does not mean that you don't care if you don't look at it. It is natural for us to want to look at it. Everything that I'm saying now are sentences that you can practically use to say to your children, I know that it's it's easy to look. We want to understand. We want to know that this is not the way to find it out. That's number one. The second thing is, 
let's go home, let's sit down, let's get some drinks. I'm known as tea and biscuits woman for, for the people that work with me because let's put some food out on the table, we're Jewish after all. Let's sit down, ask me whatever you want to know. Ask me any question you have and I will answer it and I will not lie to you. Okay, now this again doesn't mean that we show these pictures or we discuss anything like that, but we answer the question straight. Yes, it is scary. Yes, Israel is at war. What does this mean? Yes, there are people that are trying to hurt Israel. It is a difficult situation at the moment. What we are doing is the following. We are taking these steps. The government is doing X. Details, not too many details, but details. And we also have to remember, when I'm saying these things, that we have children in a family, but if this, this is not a general rule that's one size fits all. You're going to have children that are just going to be like, you know, OK, so are we going to be able to go on the holiday that we booked to go to Israel? Because, you know, we booked it and I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have children that are not going to be interested in that at all. They're going to be like, I want information. I want to know what's happening. What's going on now? Was there another siren? Who's in there? What's going on? What does it feel like in a safety room? These children, everybody is different and you can have different variations in your house and each child will require a different type of conversation. But if you follow the same line before you go into that conversation of being real, that you're not going to, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, let's not talk about it now. We're not doing any of that. Your children will begin to trust in what you say. Now, this leads me now to bedtime. And obviously what Hannah was saying was absolutely correct. Bedtime is normally the most challenging time when it comes to conversations like this. So we literally need to go into their bedroom with a notepad and a pen. And the questions come up and we say, right, let me write this down. OK, so you have just asked me what is happening to the hostages. Where are they? Are they going to get food? This is a very important question and it shows how caring you are. And I'm very proud of you to even think that way. And we're going to discuss this tomorrow at four o'clock when we come home from school, you and I are gonna sit down at the table, we're gonna have a cup of tea and we're gonna talk this through. Do you have any more questions? Tell them to me, I'm going to write them down. Okay, why is this very important? Because what you're saying to your child is, yes, we are going to, not right now. Why? Because bedtime, we all know when we're tired, we're hungry, it all comes out before we go to bed. It is not the time to have these conversations there and then. We need to show them, however, that yes, we're going to talk about it. Tell me all the information that you need and we redirect it and you make sure whatever happens, even if your child is playing and happy and anything else, you call them at four o'clock the next day from the other rooms. So please come and sit down. Do you remember we wrote these questions yesterday? We're going to sit down. Now is a great time to sit down and address them and we're going to answer them and you can ask me any more that comes up. Each one of these steps helps prepare for going to sleep and challenges at night. Why? Once you've established that dialogue with your child, once you've established their right to choose and their ability to choose what they look at, that's when, if they are unable to go to sleep, that's when you can sit and speak to them. Remember we discussed today, it is difficult. You're correct. I'm here. I've got your back. You are not alone. Okay, and we are going to talk this through. These type of sentences are very supportive, very caring and empathetic and will help a child uh, more than not relax and, and half the time our kids are like don't don't lie to me tell me the truth really you're going to hide it from me what was that that popped up on your phone I didn't see they don't trust us rightfully so we don't want to tell them what we know but we have to be very clever how we do it so I hope that helps to answer the question Yakov. Deborah, amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, I think we can all take some of those points for ourselves, uh, never mind for our children. I think it's re a really important um, area to mention, moving on a little bit from the anxiety, but also the fear that we are all feeling now in the UK and around the world 
Um, London especially has faced um, already some um, attacks, some anti-Semitic graffiti. Um, there are now going to be armed guards posted by a lot of the schools and a lot of the shuls. Um, another area that we need to work with our children is that in the next few days, and we hope it won't be um, longer than that, but we don't know. But at this point, um, it's very easy um, because there is that fear around and because um, we do have to be vigilant. It's going to be really important that we get the balance right as parents. We do have to be more careful, but at the same time, it's a tricky line because we can't be too cautious because if we do that you know if we stop allowing our children to go out of the house and we and, and their whole life and their structure changes then that means that is going to have a, a huge impact on their anxiety and it's going to take a, a sort of really a lot of sort of thinking about it what are we now going to be careful with it could well be that we won't let them um, just go out by themselves perhaps in the dark yeah. they would we wouldn't want them to go with a friend or we take, they should take a phone with them. There will be some changes, but we do it in a really, so the, the general motto is to be careful and responsible, but not too careful, not overly responsible because um, that the message that is then sent to not only ourselves, but also our children is that we are not safe and we can't go anywhere. And our whole life has sort of, um, it, it, it has changed. And so that's also really gonna be important in the next few days. Uh, as Deborah and Hannah, we echo the sort of the same message that parents, even though we ourselves, I mean, you know, don't don't think that, that therapists have got it all uh, all together, um, you know. <laughs> but we, we we have to try with our children. Um, we 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 show them that we are confident. We show them that we know what we are doing. So we give off um, that that sort of that we are in control, and we give them the instructions that this is okay. This is not okay. And um, by doing that, we, we sort of ensure that everybody is safe and um, but also at the same time, you know, content and happy. And I really want to get to an important area um, for you, Hannah, um, is that, you know, our different children, as we've mentioned, different teens and children are going to react in different ways. Um, we may have some teens that, um, want, as we said already, just want to pretend nothing's happened and, and you know, carry on in, 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 in the daily routine. But there equally are going to be some teenagers that are going to really be struggling. As parents, how do we know when what is considered as normal and what is considered as something that we should be sort of saying, hey, this is, this is not normal. We, should, we need to do something. We need to take this further beyond what we can do as parents. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, there are so many different normal responses during this time. And because it really is during an acute crisis, really strong feelings and strong reactions and changes from regular behavior are normal during this time. Um, when I was thinking, when you were speaking, I was also thinking about our children are so different in so many ways, but one way in which they might be different is if they have a neurodiversity, if they're autistic or they have ADHD. And often we know our children, and that's why I'm speaking to a room full of experts. You know your children, you know if if they have ADHD, often they're a little bit younger emotionally, so they might need more of their reassurance. They might need more of the physical tactile hugging, uh, the kind of transitional objects. Um, the love and connection in a very kind of overt way. Um, and they might need to repeat their worries. They might really need that space to talk or to act things out, to play, to come back again. Um, and, and similarly with autistic children, I think often, I think it's about 40% of, of autistic children are clinically anxious and so many more at a subclinical level. So anxiety is a real struggle for many autistic kids and kids who have experienced autistic um, um, anxiety prior to the crisis, this is gonna be a mass trigger for them. Um, so it's really thinking about drawing on your strategies that you manage anxiety with in general and really trying to use those, double down on those. I know you spoke about, uh, both of you spoke about validating the children and using emotional words. And beautifully, Deborah spoke about uh, really containing the child and reassuring the children. I think also believing in them, 
um, believing in them that they will be able to get through this. And it is an anxious time. We as a, as a people will through this. But I think our children as well, it is a scary time. Um, that I know some of the schools are advising the children not to wear their kippot when they leave the school, not to wear their blazers. That is going to provoke anxiety for, for a neurodiverse child that really might heighten their anxiety. So the way that we can, as parents, position ourselves is to be much more reassuring and really believing and validating and saying, you know, what you're going through is highly distressing. And I can't imagine how scary it must be for you at the moment, um, as it is for all of us but also believing in them that you will be able to get through this. It is gonna be distressing, it's gonna to be tough, but we will all, and you will get through this. I think some kids really need to hear that. So when do we ask for help? When do we really get concerned? So I think again, during these early stages, everything really is normal but also there's no harm in calling uh, in reaching out to people there's no harm in consulting with professionals there's no harm if you have any sort of niggle I call that the rule of the niggle that if you have any niggle that your child just is taking it a little bit far or is really getting quite withdrawn or is really kind of uh, you know you're not really sure about their behavior really kind of acting out it really could be that it is normal during this time it's a time of heightened emotions it's a we're in the acute crisis it could be that this really is normal but it could be that it's something that a bit of support will help you with so I, I would say um if you have a bit of a niggle if you have a little bit of a concern just reach out don't hesitate to and um, but more broadly speaking please god they should all be resolved and everybody should be safe and we should see a very uh, speedy resolution and no more loss but if this conflict does kind of pan out for weeks and months ahead if we find that our children's changes in behavior are getting more established and they become consistently and pervasively more withdrawn or they are playing up and acting out becoming much more angry or really irritable um or really their anxiety is really peaking and they're not being able to manage it i think that's the time when we need to to reach out and think about professional help so it's um, Thank you. Uh, your your video is sort of uh, glitching a little bit. Um, I do want to make you aware of the fact that we've mentioned some some community resources, some really important ones. Um, first of all, JTEEN is there. We are there. We have um, volunteer counsellors. We have trained therapists there for your teens. Um, we had a you know tw twelve year old boy who messaged in today. His parents asked him, you know, he was struggling reach out get some help and um, he did that and afterwards said you know he felt so much better so there are great resources as well as that I wanted to share with you a lovely organization called the helpline um, the helpline is open 24 hours a day it is there adults can um, text they can call and um, as what as we've said you know as much as if we want to help our children then we've also got to help ourselves. And um, the, the, these these issues are, are hard for us and we ourselves are struggling. Um, the helpline is, is there. Um, we are planning to do also an event tomorrow night, which is going to be just for teens. So if you do have any teenagers, uh, young adults, um, we will send out details but we want um, if teenagers want to come on and we will try and help them through any of their questions as well as that we will also do a follow-up event i know there's loads of questions we won't be able to get through everything to tonight i'll leave you with one more question but um, um we will do a follow-up event if there's demand and uh, we will address more of um the issues finally i think deborah um if i if i come to you please uh, so nice of you to to join us um from israel um, just uh, finally, for, for those children that are already um, struggling with maybe nightmares, finding it hard to sleep, we are finding that those teens are texting in um, to J Teen. What can parents do to those that already are traumatized from these events? I think it's a uh, a challenge dynamic, a challenging dynamic because um, every situation is going to be, even though it all sounds the same. Um, not the same. The fears are very, very different. You can have 10 people looking at the same image, and even though the image in itself is harrowing, the actual anxiety that's surrounding that in the background is different for different people, um, different children especially. So I think at this stage, I would recommend, again, and I'm going to follow the line that, that Hannah said, that listening 
is very important. The way we get information from our children is not by sort of, did, did you see that image and you, what it upset you when you saw how they were taken or, or that there were dead people in the picture? Sorry to be crass, but unfortunately, there's no other way of saying it. Um, is, uh, you know, we don't want to be asking those kind of questions because what that does is that steers the direction of the response that we get from our child. When we say things like, okay, let's just let's just think it through. Okay, so from what I understand, you saw an image today that was sent to you on WhatsApp or you saw it on social media? Yes. Was it one or two? Three. It was three different things. Okay, all right. So when you think about the images that you looked at, what would you say went through your mind at the time? Okay, so we start prompting questions, to start hearing about exactly what they're saying. We don't want to open those things up, but unfortunately we have to, and we have to listen because quite frankly, the damage, even though it's not irreparable at the time for the child is done. I've seen it, can't get it out of my head, right? One of the um, great techniques that I thoroughly enjoy doing with children in session is that I always have a whiteboard, I've got one behind me as well, that I ask the child to draw, and it's, it's absolutely fine for all ages, I've done this right up to sometimes adults, draw in their head, from their head, what uh, the, the frightening scene or a frightening something that they've seen, and then we can re edit that with illustrations on top of it. There are, and at the moment, as I'm saying, it's, it's difficult to specifically give direct advice because we don't yet know in each, each situation what is actually the fear. So we have to be very careful not to mask it by just saying, oh, it's got to be this and it's got to be that. So it's very important to ask those type of prompting questions to get the information out. Most of the time you'd be surprised it's not what we actually think it is, okay? So lots of sentences to say, and you know, again, this can sound like we're not in solidarity, but we know that that's not the case. It is not here, okay? Even in central Israel, I'm in Telmond, we are, it's when my children, my children, children that I've treated near to where I'm living, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna be storming the streets? Are they gonna come into our house? It is further away from us right now, okay? It is not at our doorstep, it is okay. We have the army, we have the police force. Our town, for example, is surrounded by armed guards at every entrance and exit because we are five minutes down the road from an Arab village that were shooting their rifles in the middle of the night in celebration two days ago. Um, so we've got this constant dialogue that's being said that is, yes, it is, very, it is not right here, right here, right now, where are we? Okay, sitting at my desk, comfy chair. I've got a glass of water. Okay, let's just feel where we're at. We're right here. I'm here. I love you. I've got your back. I'm here to protect you. These kind of statements are very grounding. When we're, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, no, no, back to me. Right here, right now, here. Okay? And we're not looking at what's going to happen tomorrow. We're not looking at what's going to happen in an hour. Right now, for the next 10 minutes, we're just going to sit together. I'm going to sit on your bed. We're going to cuddle. And we're going to talk about when we went to the beach during the summer and we had a great time. Okay, by the way, was it you who found that starfish in the sea and you nearly jumped over it and got frightened by the crab? Or was it me whose toe got bitten? You know, to make a whole nice, that unfortunately did happen, but, you know, make a whole nice uh, redirection and if it comes by, I'm still scared. Yes, it is scary. You're right. But right now, this is where we are at. And if it's okay, Yaakov, I just want to reference the point that you made regarding you know, how you guys are tackling this dynamic of what we do with our children. How protective do we be? You know, what is right, what is not right, and keeping that balance. That one of the sentences that's always important to repeat in those dynamics is. It's this is not how it's going to be forever. OK, this is not for the rest of time. For the moment, it's Monday. OK, 
between now and Friday, we're just going to take some extra precautions in the same way that if, God forbid, we had tonsillitis, we would stay home, we would take norofen and paracetamol and have antibiotics, to, and we'd have that week off school to get better, okay? There are changes that we have to make just because we need to be a little bit extra careful, but it's not forever. It's just for right now. Let's reassess on Friday. If you've got any questions, ask me. If you've got any other ideas, I'm open for ideas. You've always got great ideas. Tell me what your ideas are and let's see if we can find a solution together. These kind of dialogues, exactly as Hannah said again, sorry, Hannah, I'm referencing you over and over again. I hope that's okay. That you're giving your child a level of agency to be part of the decision-making process rather than a dictatorial, this is what we are doing and why. It's very unnerving and it's anxiety inducing so just by introducing some of these things it's very important along with saying and explaining why we need to take those precautions why why are you taking me to school today why am i not going on the bus very good question it's a good question and you're right because today and tuesday wednesday thursday friday we're just taking a little bit of a different shape this week, taking extra precautions. OK, so that's all. And you're right, but we're just being extra careful. And that's what we're doing this week. So it has a, a, a time limit. It can be reassessed and extended, but that doesn't need to be discussed on Monday when it will be discussed on Friday. So it's just about making it very manageable in small lots for parents to have the mummy, 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 mummy. I've got my answer. And for the child to feel, okay, well, that makes sense. Now I can I can do that. I can I can get engaged with that. So that was just uh, in, in response to what you said before, Yakov. Okay, amazing. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. I'm going to sort of wrap it up, but we appreciate all the time that you've given us and for everyone coming on and, and sort of our prayers, our thoughts are all with um, you all in Israel. And we hope that we don't have to have a follow-up of this event but if we do then we will be there um and can i just make you aware of the fact that on the chat option um there is a little survey that you can fill out um if you want to be made aware of um, any future j -teen events you can um, there's a link as well there and if you've got any questions you would like us to address um, further then you can also uh, make us aware of that thank you so so much um to all our panelists, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Deborah. And we're wishing you all a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.